Good evening. We are at the Institute for Global Education at 1118 Wealthy Southeast, and we're filming an, another segment of our IGE Talks tonight with a special guest, Tom Burke, who has returned from Venezuela with the latest information on what is really happening there. And a number of our uh, members here have gathered tonight to learn whatever we can. Uh, he had a slideshow ready to go, but as it is many times, the audiovisual portion of the program may have to wait until later when we can work on it some more. Uh, right now, uh, all of us are interested in whether or not we're getting the truth about Venezuela as the American press is uh, presenting it. I think we have a right to be skeptical because we have never gotten a straight story on any of the Latin American or South American countries. The invasion of Panama, I recall uh, people down there talking about the North Americans, that's us. We think we're the Americans, we're the only ones. No, we're the North Americans, okay? And we invaded Panama illegally, despite the, the United Nations voting against it. And we walked in and arrested Emmanuel, Emmanuel uh, Noriega, put him, tried him uh, for drug dealing, which we were doing along with him through the CIA at the time, and put him in prison. And then returned uh, uh, Panama to their, their rightful uh, rich owners, who then proceeded to uh, make it one of the number one drug dealing bank uh, laundering countries in that part of the world. So this is nothing new to us. The whole history of Latin America, South America, is rife with stories about how the United States, under the Monroe Doctrine or whatever doctrine, the Reagan Doctrine, you name it, uh, <coughs> interfered with the lives of the people that live in these regions. So I'm here tonight, and I think all of us are here tonight to hear what uh, Tom Burke has to say about it all. Tom Burke is a, a member of IGE and a, a former board member, uh, Mike Franz, if you haven't guessed, um, and we have other board members present here. And eventually, after he's had a chance to bring us up to date, we'll be asking questions. So Tom, tell us about your travels. Well, thank you for inviting me. I wanted to tell people about this trip because, uh, frankly, it's the best trip I've ever taken in my life. I've been to El Salvador and Colombia which is, Colombia is right next door to uh, Venezuela and suffers many human rights violations. Uh, activists, trade unionists are killed every week in that country. Uh, in comparison, my trip to Colombia was just a great place to go. My wife was asking me before I left if I wasn't worried about violence or wasn't afraid that you know people might be trying to do harm to Americans who go there, and I said, no, absolutely not. I think it's uh, the best time to go, and we're being welcomed there as friends because we're going to report on what we see and what we hear in Fight Back News. And um, if you read Fight Back News, we wrote about 12 different uh, news reports from Venezuela the week I was there. We traveled the last week of April, and our main purpose was to go for the 1st of May for International Workers' Day because we knew there would be a big rally and that President Maduro would give a speech. So we wanted to go down there in solidarity with the Bolivarian Revolution, the ongoing revolution that's been unfolding since Hugo Chavez was elected in, in the late 90s and um, continues today with President Maduro. And boy, did we pick the right time to go, you know? Uh, the, the first day that we were down there, we had only one meeting. I wanted to go meet with the Communist Party to find out what they do and how they organize. And I had once brought uh, the head of a trade union federation from Venezuela about 17 years ago, brought him to Detroit for the Labor Notes Conference. And so that's who arranged for us to meet. And um, they were very excited to meet with us. And, one of their people interpreted, and he had lived in the U.S., uh, including Minneapolis, for many years. So he was super excited to hear what was happening and to understand how we build struggles against Trump. Uh, they had heard that our trade union movement in the U.S. had kind of risen in the last couple of years, where there were more strikes, the teachers' strikes, 
hotel worker strikes. So we spent a lot of time talking about the working class both in the U.S. but also in Venezuela. And they talked quite frankly that they're in the midst of a developing revolution and while things are much better than they were at any time previously for working people and for small farmers and peasants in the countryside, that there were still difficulties. And those difficulties mainly arise because of the way Trump and the U.S. government and now some of the European governments treat Venezuela. As soon as Venezuelans say, we're going to take our country back and make it serve the purposes of Venezuelans, then all of a sudden the U.S. under Obama and now more so under Trump start putting sanctions on the economy and saying, well, these business people, they support the elected government of Venezuela, so they can't do business not just in the U.S., but anywhere internationally. So there's like 60 billion or more dollars of sanctions against Venezuela. You know, you can't get some basic medical needs met now because the medicines are difficult to get. What the Venezuelans are doing, and they've moved rapidly to solve the problem, is they're going to China, or they're going to Russia, or they're going to India, countries that want to trade with them and want to provide medical supplies or other things needed. So that's how they've overcome it. The other thing is that there's um, like 20,000 to 30,000 Cubans who now live in Venezuela. Most of those are healthcare workers. Uh, you know, the, 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 the topic of this speech is, uh, you know, what, what are the lies about the U.S. telling on Venezuela, you know? What does the U.S. say about Venezuela that it's not true? So you'll read in the U.S. that there's, you know, tens of thousands of Cuban soldiers in, uh, in Venezuela. Well, these soldiers are going door to door helping people for the first time to get their medical needs met. So you have doctors and nurses. A majority of the Cubans are women, about 60%. And um, they are, they've been there for, for almost two decades now. And um, they've changed the whole healthcare system away from a private, for-profit healthcare system to a system that serves the people and meets the needs of the people. If the sanctions from the US and the European Union weren't placed upon Venezuela, their healthcare system would probably be, alongside Cuba's, the best in this part of the world, you know, North or South America. But as it is, they're struggling to deal with like getting diabetics the medicines they need. But China's filling the gap, but it, it takes time. Um, the day before I left, I read an article that there was an egg shortage in Venezuela, that you couldn't get, you know, chicken eggs, right, hen eggs. And um, I didn't tell my host this, but when we got picked up at the airport, the first place they took us, we, it was a Sunday, so they wanted to take us to Chinatown in Caracas. And I thought, well, that'll be neat to see, you know, a national minority, a Chinese minority that has its own neighborhood within a Latin American country, you know, kind of neat. And um, so the, the restaurants were closed, but this big market was open. And, and it, was, it was fun to go there and see everybody speak Spanish. If you're a Chinese immigrant, you speak Spanish fluently. And there's a lot of bartering, which is different than how we trade, right? So there's a lot of back and forth. And we, of course, had dollars. So we had to barter dollars, the conversion to bolivars, which is their currency, and then buy what we wanted. But there were stacks of eggs in that place, I got to tell you. I had read about this egg shortage, and the first thing I go to do without any plan is go to buy eggs, you know? And so to me, I was like, well, that's how this trip is going to be, you know? We're going to say, well, here's what we hear in the U.S., and then we're going to see and experience a different reality. So <clears throat> after uh, the next day, we woke up very early in the morning because we were excited to be in Caracas. So we were up a few minutes after six. And I went to look out the window. We were in an upper middle class neighborhood. And I went to look out uh, the screens, you know, it's open uh, windows. So I suddenly heard someone yelling, my God, my God, freedom at the top of her lungs. And I turned to my friend who's Venezuelan and I said, 
Well, uh, your people pray with more enthusiasm than our people pray, you know? I said, what's going on that this woman's yelling at the top of her lungs? And he said, I don't know. He, he looked concerned. And then we started hearing other noises. And in fact, what it was is that we were only a mile and a half from the airport where the attempted coup d'etat by the US backed Guaido was happening. So we were right, right near it. So some of the wealthy people in this neighborhood had gone out on the streets to start chanting freedom and banging pots and pans. Now, it is a sight to see rich people protest. <laughs> it is. There were 30 women out there in high heels on the corner. Oh, no. Yep. And, and they're chanting, and you know they're trying their best, but it just, they really didn't have it down, you know? that you could tell it, they were new to this, this type of uh, thing. But uh, on a serious note, what happened at the airport is that uh, Juan Guaido, who's Trump's hand-picked uh, you know, uh, coup maker, he uh, went and got this other guy out of prison. And uh, the other man was under house arrest for previous protests against the government that had turned violent. And his name is Leopoldo Lopez. And he's responsible for 20 people being killed during protests. And who did they choose to kill in protest? Well, if you didn't look like an upper class Venezuelan, they would go after you. So a lot of the Venezuelans are very much from the heritage of Africa, indigenous people, and Europeans, right? Most most Venezuelans identify with all those heritages, and that's how they call themselves Venezuelan. But in the upper classes, you tend to have you know, more European backgrounds. Mm. Not entirely, but it tends to be that way. So if you were at a protest and you didn't look like them, they might target you and kill you. And the other thing the wealthy people do is they hire street gangs and drug gangs, and they hire them to basically patrol the streets and block off people from being able to shop on days that they protest. And if you try to go against them, you're going to experience violence. So when people say the opposition, that op opposition is a violent opposition. And so when they're under house arrest or in prison, it's because they've e either tried to violently overthrow the government, or they've killed people, or injured people. The housing uh, department of the old government is what I'm going to say, like 25 years ago. If you drive by that, it's burned out because people have been throwing Molotov cocktails and trying to burn it down. Who's against housing, right? You, you got to be pretty sick in the head to oppose people having housing. But that's what the opposition is about. And I, I want people to understand, they're not friendly. We were kept very closely guarded by the people who hosted us because they were very worried that you know the opposition might see us and try to approach us and harm us. So we were very careful about where we went and when we went. But that said, the day the coup d'etat happened, by 10 o'clock we knew that the coup d'etat had been defeated because we were texting with government ministers. By 12 o'clock, we had written a, an article for Fight Back News saying, no coup, people, Venezuelan people mobilized to defend their president and the Bolivarian Revolution. We're the only people, the only journalists there on the ground who wrote that there was no coup. The news here, I understand, continued to 6 p.m. saying the coup's going to succeed, Maduro's on his way out of the country, Maduro's flying to Cuba. It was all lies. What the, what, when I got home, a lot of people asked me, well, what about the Russians in Venezuela? And I kept wondering why they kept asking me, because I didn't see any Russians in Venezuela, <laughs> not a one. And I know they have some military presence training people to use weapons that they've purchased and whatnot. But the reason that came up is because once Trump and Bolton realized the coup had been defeated, they were at some international meeting and so they sent their guy to talk to the Russians. So that became the news. But the, Trump's government talked with the Russians about changing things in Venezuela. Instead of the fact that the US tried to overthrow a sovereign government, an elected government, 
and then failed. And the reason they failed is because Maduro's government set them up. They thought they had three people with them. One, one a police uh, official, one a government minister, and one with the military. Well, two of those knew they were, they were playing along. And by 12 noon, they had publicly said, oh, we, we played the US, and that's why this whole thing happened and how it failed. The police official actually was a traitor and went to the other side. So that, that shows you that the US is still trying to play. It also shows you that within Venezuela, the revolution's not complete. You still have people who are willing to betray it for money or power, you know? They either want immediate <coughs> payment or they want to become the leaders of the government during the counter-revolution. So that's what we saw uh, up until 12 noon on the day of the coup. Then we went to a conference for housing where we learned that the Venezuelans have built 3.7 million new housing units in eight years time. That's where the money goes. They say everyone's poor and everyone's you know suffering. Well, 10 million people out of 30 million population have new housing. And I got up close and saw some of this housing. Each unit has a refrigerator, a stove, a washer and dryer, a water heater, and an air conditioner. That's what you get when you get your new apartment built. What do you have to do to get the apartment building? You have to contribute a dollar and work. So what does the work consist of? For some people, it means they participate in the building, in the construction work, and they learn new trades. For other people, it means they become part of the organizing of the neighborhood. Everywhere you go in Caracas, you see teams of people cleaning the streets, or painting buildings, or fixing fences. It's all part of this program that people are trying to change their society to take care of each other, and to think collectively instead of everyone out for themselves and it's making a big difference. Um, these apartment buildings uh, look like the new condos you see being built uh, in downtown Grand Rapids. The new condos. The affordable ones. The expensive ones. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's what they look like, I'm telling you. <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're not, you know, what we think of as low-income housing. These are nice buildings. Uh, you have Chinese and Vietnamese firms that come over and work with Venezuelans so they can take control of the firms eventually. But I saw the Chinese cement firms there, you know, cranking out cement to build new homes. They use bricks a lot because they say brick buildings are better than cement, something uh, I think might be debatable, but that, that's what they said. All right, so we went to this conference. They had experts from Belarus, from Cuba, from uh, other countries in Europe, uh, all there to help the Venezuelans figure out the next phase of their housing project development. When you drive through Caracas, there are vast slums on the hillsides and the mountainsides, and they want to do away with the slums. They don't want to do away with neighborhoods, but they want to do away with the poverty and the slums that exist. So that's what we learned about at the conference, and um, our host is part of that. So I also want to talk about something related to that. Our host is an eco-socialist. He looks at farming and gardening and food production and how to take care of the environment instead of just using it for profit, right? And so eco-socialism is kind of a new idea to me. I've heard of it, but I haven't studied a lot. But what he talked about is all the gardening that they do in the cities. So you have neighborhoods. We visited the electrical uh, facilities where the whole grid for the country's electricity, 500 workers work out of this one facility. And so they have a workshop, they have a warehouse, they have a yard for all their heavy equipment and the giant spools of, uh, of uh, electric wires they need. In that place, people eat collectively. So there's a crew of women from the neighborhood that come in every day and they set the menu, they order the food, most of the food is grown in this neighborhood in the city, which I couldn't believe. And they feed 500 workers every day. And it's gourmet food. I got to eat there. It is gourmet food, and it is terrific. And 
what they plan to do this summer is have 3,000 more meals. So they're going to start inviting people from the neighborhood to come eat at the, the, the electric facility, right? And so it becomes part of that neighborhood, not just because it's a place to go to work, but because it's a place that the whole community interacts with and is involved in. So those are the types of changes they're making, and, and they're big and expansive changes, and they're doing it all over the country. But in the city, there's six to eight million people in Caracas, so that's a big change there. We, uh, from there, we went downtown to where uh, the, the presidential palace is. And we got there late, but there were still about twenty or 30,000 people gathered. <laughs> yeah, because they, they mobilized to defend the presidency. And they didn't bring weapons, they just brought their bodies. And we could see them when we drove past the women in the high heels banging the pots and pans. We, we drove right by where the, the military and the police had mobilized against the coup attempt. So they were out by the airport. and then. And just to say, 80% of the soldiers who, who were mobilized for that coup, they realized they had been tricked to show up there. And so they left and ran to the airbase and begged to be taken in by the military on the airbase. And they made them wait outside because they said, well, we don't know why, why you're trying to come on the base, but we'll call and get buses to come pick you up. But th that, most, most of them did not want to participate. And the ones who did fled to either uh, the Spanish embassy or the Brazilian embassy. And the people thought, well, Brazil will support the US. Well, they turned those soldiers back out that night. They wouldn't take them in either. And so they had to go on the run, because you know, you're a traitor to your military. That's, you're going to end up in prison at, at, at best. So we got down to where the presidential palace is. and. It was actually kind of a festival by the time we got there. People were really happy. And we stuck out like a sore thumb. There were four of us from the US. And um, you know, uh, a journalist, uh, a radio journalist saw us. And he came over and asked who we were, just chit-chatting. And then he said, could I interview you? And we said, of course. So they interviewed us to ask us our opinions about the US coup d'etat and Trump. And once that happened, we spent a good eight hours doing interviews the rest of the day. And then people would come up uh, and hug us. Families would come up and ask to take photos with us. Uh, people from unions and community groups, women who run uh, feminist groups, they all wanted to come and take photos and talk to us. So that's how we spent the rest of our day. We were very busy doing interviews in Spanish with all the national media and Russia Today and Telesur, and uh, I did a radio interview with a woman from El Salvador. So we had a very busy time after that. The next morning was when uh, May Day happened. And I have to tell you, uh, it's the best May Day I've been to. A million people turned out. And they started their march at the military academy and went for miles, miles and miles, a million people from all over the country. We met the, the um, gold miners union. We met the tax collectors union. We met neighborhood defense groups because they defend themselves when the right wing tries to physically attack their neighborhoods. Women and men mobilize and defend the neighborhoods. We saw the people's militia. There's a militia that um, has hundreds of thousands of members and uh, you know, they're going to try to build a militia with two million people in it. And what's a people's militia? Uh, there's people like us in this room who are leaders in the militia. And it's not just young guys or something. It's neighborhood people. And they have weapons, and they train, and they are going to defend their country from the U.S. invasion if it ever comes. If Colombia attacks, Colombia is going to be in trouble because there's going to be people all over Venezuela who are prepared to defend their country and their land. You know? And so you can see there's a photo in the, in the slideshow that I sent around that uh, a militia member asked if he could come take a photo with me. So it's one of my favorite photos. Of so 
On the day of May Day, uh, the only speech was given by Maduro. And I think you'd be surprised. It's not like your typical politician speech. But he, the gist of what he said is, the U.S. tried again to overthrow us. They've tried before to kill the president. They tried with a drone attack two years ago to kill President Maduro. Uh, they tried to overthrow Chavez and did for two days, three days. And it was the first time a U.S. coup didn't work in the history of Latin America mm. and was reversed. And the reason it was reversed is because there were military who were loyal to the presidency in the Constitution. And that made a big difference. The second reason is because the masses of people, hundreds of thousands of people mobilized into the streets to defend the revolution and to tell the coup makers, we're not gonna allow you to do this, you know? If, if, if you want to do it, you're going to have to fight the people to do it. And they're brave, and it's their revolution, so they're, they're going to defend it. So <clears throat> the, day, uh, the day of uh, Maduro's speech, he spoke about how the, the, the coup that Trump attempted was a turning point, that they had been acting very defensively as a government and as a political movement and as a revolution and that that defensiveness was going to go away. He said, of course, if they try to hiss, hit us, we'll hit back. But from now on, we're going on the offensive. We're moving forward. We have to make new plans. And then he talked about the mistakes that they had make, been making with corruption, with uh, planning that didn't go well, with um, trying to figure out uh, how to build a new economy that wasn't based solely on oil profit. Right, mm -hmm. And so there's a big shift in their economy that's been going on, not just a few years, but for 20 years, where they moved away from basing it around the oil industry. So it, that's still isn't important. Isn't that why there was the opposition in the first place? That's right. Yep. Can you tell us, uh, did they nationalize their oil industry like some other countries have? Well, it's been nationalized for a long time, but it still mainly served U.S. companies and the right. refineries were in the U.S. Right. And Sitco was always a few cents cheaper because it was from Venezuela. Right. And so the, even though the industry was nationalized, the wealthy elite are the ones who ran it and controlled it. And so they had a friends and family plan. Oh, I got a cousin who needs a job. Okay, well, we'll make up some job as a manager at an oil uh, you know, firm. And uh, he won't really have to work much. He can probably golf most days and go out for lunch for two, two or three hours. But now he has this high paying job. And all that got wiped away by Chavez. When they, when they did a lockout against Chavez, when the coup d'etat against Chavez failed, then they did an oil uh, company lockout, you know? And so Chavez said, fine, you're all fired. So he didn't fire the oil workers, he fired their bosses, <laughs> right? And so then they had to bring in new bosses. And that, that's disruptive to an industry. Yeah. But most of them weren't working anyway, to be honest. So it wasn't that disruptive. And so their oil industry continues today, but the U.S. doesn't buy any more of it. But India wants to buy more of it. China has deals with them. Cuba has a, a big deal with them. So they're continuing that industry. But my point is they're shifting the economy so that Venezuelans make things that Venezuelans need. What's the prime example? It's food. When Chavez was elected, 70 to 80 percent of food was imported into the country. And the grocery stores are full of food. It's very expensive, but they're full. And there's one company that pretty much controls all the grocery store chains and the food distribution system before Chavez. Now, today, 70% of food is grown inside Venezuela. And so what they did is they seized land from big landowners who claimed they own land but didn't. They took public land and made up fake deeds, or they just seized it and used it to graze cattle. But it wasn't their land. It was public-owned land. So they redivided these into farms. And those struggles still continue today. Just last week, a big landowner got the local police to kick 40 families off the land, right? Surprising when there's a revolutionary government. But he's with the right-wing opposition, 
and the local re police respond to him. But the national police have to come in and set things right, that that land belongs not to him, but is owned by the government, and the government decides who farms it. We want 40 families to farm it instead of one guy to use, use it for cattle ranching, because we want it to be productive. The goal, they don't have socialism yet. But their goal is to have a productive economy that serves the needs of the people, yeah. right? You can't do banking there right now because of the U.S. sanctions. So if, if you cash a check, it takes 30 to 40 days to clear because the European Union and the U.S. cut off their banking system. So everything's done in cash, you know, and there's high inflation rates which have been brought under control. But the U.S. is trying to wreck the economy so that people rebel against it and go back to the old way where the rich people in the U.S. get to control it. But that's not going to happen. And, and I think Trump admitted it the other day even in public. If you look it up, Trump admitted that he's not going to touch Venezuela for a while Trump, yeah. because he doesn't think he can, he can do anything about the Bolivarian revolution. So that's the good news. He's uh, focused on other things that uh, he also gets wrong, but he, he, he's, he's backed off of Venezuela f for now. <coughs> they, um, they think they can control a country by, uh, you know, through wrecking their finances, but that's not the way economies work. Economies work based on producing things, producing them locally if possible, and building up from there. And, and I'd like to comment on that, you know, because mm -hmm. we just had a UN report that we reported on in one of our other IDPE talks. Uh, we have the United Nations release report that gave us 12 years to get our act in order on carbon. We have to cut it in half, or we're in deep, deep doo doo. And there are reports now that things are going faster with the environment. Reports from, you know, uh, places like uh, Greenland. So forth with the, you know, the, uh, the tundra is melting off seven years faster than we thought it would, and so forth. And there was a book put out by uh, the author. Uh, the book is called Earth E W A R T H. Deliberately misspelled because uh, the author felt that uh, when we reached 350 parts uh, carbon per uh, you know unit, we would be in deep trouble and irreversible. Uh, environmental loss. And he recommended in that book, he says, when we get to the future, which isn't that far away now, the, we're going to have to have local grown food. We aren't going to be able to depend on these great international whatevers. We're going to have to have our locally produced energy, our locally produced food, and the, and the people that can do that are going to survive, and the ones that can't aren't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the United States is doing nothing right now about that problem. So that's the system that's very that short-sighted Venezuela on our part, but maybe very long-sighted or fortunate for Venezuela too, because there looks like they're going to do it. You know, they can survive the climate crisis by doing, you know, by they're, just they're already well them. into it. And there's something called the CLAP program, C L A P, and every two weeks, every household gets a box of food delivered from this program. And it has all your basic necessities. Fruits and vegetables on the street are very inexpensive to buy. So you have the CLAP program that provides basics like flour, um, powdered milk, uh, salt, you know, things that you, you really need uh, in your household. And then, <coughs> and in addition, some meat and some protein, maybe some fish. Uh, it's all delivered by, by this program throughout the whole country. So every family gets food delivered. And then you can also, in addition, buy at the markets. And they're trying to set up cooperatives. And they're trying to set up uh, you know, street markets like you have here on a Saturday morning. And they're trying to challenge this one ownership uh, grocery sy store system. So you'll hear people say, oh, I had to wait in line at the grocery store. Or things are five times more expensive. But what they're talking about, what's expensive, is the extra virgin olive oil they want from Italy. It's not the milk or the cheese or the you know basic meats and vegetables. It's the high-end stuff 
that you pay a lot here mm -hmm. for. So for me, I, those complaints uh, don't don't carry much. But what about education? Well, let's talk about two more things, uh, okay. including education. The electricity system was stressed when I was there, but that's because it had been attacked a few weeks earlier. They discovered that there was a cyber attack from the U.S. arising out of Chicago and Houston is where they pinpointed it to. And there's one large uh, dam at a reservoir in the east of Venezuela that provides most of the hydroelectricity for the country, right? And <coughs> So they had that cyber attack, uh, generator problems, and then some people went out and took pot shots uh, locally at, at the electric systems, you know? So you have the opposition that's still willing uh, to, to, to do kind of physical structure attacks. And it shut down everything. But I'd like to also point out that Argentina and Uruguay and Paraguay also just had a shutdown of their electric system that was three times bigger than the state of Texas, you know? And nobody said that their government should be overthrown or they should be invaded. But when Venezuela has a problem caused in part by an attack from the U.S., Trump is saying, oh, they can't take care of anything. These socialists are failures and let's invade the country. So while we were there, there was electricity the entire time um, that we, we were in the apartment or the house or wherever we went to restaurants. So I didn't see any trouble. There might be temporary blackouts, but welcome to Grand Rapids if you want temporary blackouts yeah. and electricity. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've had them every year since I've lived here. So to me, it wasn't un unusual. People would apologize. I'd say, well, that's reality where I live, so I don't know why you're apologizing. Right-wing people in, in Venezuela and here say to me, what about all the violence in Venezuela? And I would say, don't you know I'm from Chicago? I said, have you never heard of Chicago? They don't have violence compared to us. They used to have violence. But because of the changes in the economy and the government taking away the profit motive for drug gangs, not allowing people to just have weapons because they want to own weapons, you know, you can, own, you can own a weapon if you're part of the people's militia. Everyone who belongs to the people's militia gets a weapon. But it's organized, and it's thought through, and it's through legal channels. But they're taking it away from the drug gangs and the thugs, and they've gone out of business largely. You can read New York Times articles about that. So there's not a bunch of violence the way there used to be in that country. All right, on elections, I want to say this. You hear a lot that the election that Maduro ran wasn't fair. Well, Jimmy Carter was down there, and he said it was fair. He said it's one of the better elections you could see. And he, wow. he his group went and looked at uh, all the elections in Venezuela before that and says they're some of the best in the world. So I'm with Jimmy Carter. If you want to know what Trump did is four months before the election happened, they already said it was disqualified before it even happened. <laughs> How do you do that? How do you disqualify an election before it happens? And, and, uh, and all the Republicans voted on that, and so did 11 Democrats, including Bernie Sanders. He, he pre-voted that it was a bad election. Really? Yeah, I don't know how you decide that, but it seems kind of funny to me. And this is coming from you know a president who didn't win the popular vote. Now right? you know I'm going to research that on Bernie Sanders, right? <laughs> yep, I'm gonna fact check that. it's easy to find. Uh, the other thing is uh, Bernie also called Chavez a uh, dead communist dictator, which sounds kind of uh, obnoxious to me. On the other hand, Bernie doesn't want to go to war there, so I'm for Bernie not wanting to go to war. But I think Bernie better go study Venezuela and look at what democracy actually looks like. Me, I like democracies where money doesn't decide who wins where people campaign on their beliefs and they have an equal playing field and equal access to the media and it's not bought and sold elections based on advertising. And that's what's happening in Venezuela. You'll also hear, well, they didn't allow the opposition to run. Now, this is patently untrue. There was an opposition candidate and he's a bona fide right-wing candidate who wants the U.S. to back him and wants rich people to run Venezuela. He, that's what he says. 
who didn't get to run was Leopoldo Lopez, the guy under house arrest who helped to lead a movement that killed 20 civilians out on the streets of the country. You know, of course you don't let people run for office when they're trying to overthrow the government. That's just obvious to me. He's lucky he's under house arrest. And now he's in Spain. He, he fled to Spain during the coup d'etat. That's the kind of leader he, he is. He said, I'm going to get out and lead a coup d'etat, but as soon as it went bad, he ran away, you know? So he's gone too. Um, Tom, I totally don't think the U.S. should be involved in Venezuela. I think we should be way out. But you love the country. You love the government. Are there any mm -hmm. problems there that are the government's fault? Yeah. They don't crack down on corruption enough in the past, so they're starting to do that. But again, th then you start to hear Wall Street say, oh, they're being unfair to so-and-so Mr. Millionaire, you know? And they're treating him unfairly. But they're not. They're following the law. They're following the court system. When, again, back to the, uh, the, the election process, when the National Assembly was elected, the right wing won. But they immediately said, we're going to strip the president of his powers and get rid of him. That's what they moved to do. You know who else tried to do this? Wisconsin. And Michigan. Yeah, Wisconsin. Too. That's right. In Michigan. Yeah, the Republicans here. And what happened? Well, some of what they tried to do ends up in the Supreme Court of the state, and the court makes rulings. In Venezuela, it got kicked to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do the other thing, you can't get rid of the president because you don't like him. And they said, we don't care what the Supreme Court says because they're with, with the dictator. That's what they said. And so when they started passing these laws and trying to enact them, they're in violation of the Constitution. They're breaking the law. So then they have to end up in court, which they refuse to do. So you have that ongoing battle. And, um, you know, the, the speech that Maduro gave basically said, look, our revolution has made a lot of mistakes. He read letters from women that had written to him. He read their letters out loud to a million people saying, dear Mr. President, I respect you, but. And then they would say what they were unhappy about with the government, you know. And, uh, you know, people want better health care. People want better food supplies and markets. People want um, better transportation systems. The public transportation was left to linger. One, one innovation they made, which I just thought was spectacular, there's a, there's a mountainside um, shanty town that didn't have access to the city center or to regular shopping districts, right? And the buses would take two hours. You could see this hillside, right, this mountainside, but it'd take that long for a bus to get down traffic. So they built a trolley system, you know, just with uh, like, like a ski lift. I don't know what else you call it. And so that just runs all day. Kids ride it just for fun, because <laughs> it's just fun. <laughs> and so they, they do all of that. So anyway, we, we, had a, we had an amazing week. We worked very hard. We did lots of interviews. We got to visit you know, everything from the equivalent of uh, West Point, uh, their military academy. We got to drive through there on May Day to um, Telesur, the national, uh, you know, radio, TV, and newspaper place. They had 100 reporters in a room working, you know, on their news. And they have a lot of electronic social media. I would say the average age was under the age of 30. Lots of young people participating. And the majority in that room were women of the reporters, you know. So they're very conscious of who's participating and who's in leadership. We met with a cabinet minister. She's in charge of like what they call popular power, the people's movements. And um, she sets up communas where neighborhood associations where people can participate in basic democratic decision making about their neighborhoods and about what they want. If they want a park instead of a bar, they can figure out ways to move the bar somewhere else and build a park because it's the people deciding 
and not just the business uh, association who gets to decide anymore. Um, if they want to change the way their schooling is done, those community groups meet with teachers groups and teachers unions and they make the decisions together. So there's a lot of micro democracy, maybe you call it, local level decision making. You mean the unions are there. allowed? Uh, unions are encouraged, not just <laughs> allowed. <laughs> unions are encouraged. Being facetious, but yeah. No, we saw a lot of unions I made it. It was just like stream after stream of union members all dressed. I met the Socialist Concrete Workers Union. I made them take a picture with me. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of activity happening and a lot of people participate. And um, I think there's a lot, a, lot, a lot of potential there if they go forward towards socialism. And I'm very excited about it, as, as you well say. But yeah, they have a lot of problems to solve too, but they're their problems to solve and not Trump's. <laughs> yes, that is. <laughs> well, what we hear all the time is a food shortage, that there's no food there and people are starving, and that's not what we found out. I mean, you can see in the photos, there's at least two that are in restaurants, and uh, it's true that the restaurants aren't filled the way they used to be, but that's because lots of the rich people have left. So we went to the restaurants that the rich people used to eat in. And we, for, for what I would consider a $40, $50 meal in Grand Rapids, we spent about $10 each. And they were happy to have us there and came and talked to us, you know. We avoided politics, but, uh, you know, in my view, we ate like kings while we were there. And, you know, we met, we met everyday people and, so they weren't putting out the red carpet for you. Like these are the American journalists that are coming here. We're going to treat them with. Well, the red carpet, in the sense politics. of the Bolivarian Revolution, <laughs> is a red revolution, <laughs> sure. Right, sure. But um, <laughs> no, we paid for our own meals out, and um, uh -huh. but. And you had eggs for breakfast. Every day, I had <laughs> every eggs for day. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they were good eggs too. Yeah. Farm, yeah. Oh my. Yeah. Other, other questions, people? Let, let me say this, there's, yeah. uh, uh, in terms of food, I asked, um, oh, have, uh, have a lot of restaurants and uh, panaderias, the, the bakeries, and small food shops, I said, they must have uh, shut down a lot of them uh, because of the violence and because of the, the political strife. And um, I asked different people this, and they all said, no, there's actually more shops than ever. And we have more internal shopping malls, you know, in, indoor malls than we've ever had. And that's also due to the government policy, encouraging local food production, local ownership of shops to sell that food when it's produced. And you have cooperatives starting to set up, so it's not just individual owners anymore. Uh, Grand Rapids is getting a food co-op uh, in the next year or two, I noticed Hopefully. too. Um, so they're doing it on a mass scale in every neighborhood and every, every little city and town. And so that's quite different than here. So you kind of, kind of have to wonder what would happen if Guatemala uh, behaved this way and started making changes along the lines of Venezuela. Well, they, they tried to. Would their people be lining up at our borders, right, screaming that their lives are in danger? trying to escape by the tens of thousands. I One know. problem in Guatemala is that some places which used to be wonderful farmland are now deserts. So that a lot of people cannot grow crops, literally. And nobody can grow crops there. And that's caused part of the reason that so many people are leaving Venezuela. I would be surprised. Guatemala. Look what the United States did to Haiti. They yeah. they, they send in, uh, you know, uh, they send in cheap sugar, and ruined all of their local plantations run by the people, and they bankrupted the country. You know, all of a sudden they had no economy, and we sent corn to Mexico. Did the same thing virtually. Uh, you know, we, we can play economic terrorism, and we're good at it. And these people are very susceptible to it. I mean, they, they need some leadership there that one of those things that happen, obviously. Just a question for you. 
You said the rich people are leaving Venezuela or certain areas. So what does that mean for the people that remain? Because I assume they take their wealth with them. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So, um, you know, there's reports of uh, millions leaving, which I don't think is accurate. But I think it's true that hundreds of thousands of wealthy Venezuelans and middle class professionals to have left and they take what they own with them, you know, uh, in the form of uh, investments. They withdraw their investments and look for new places to invest. If they move to Miami, Florida or, you know, other parts of uh, Latin America. That's been happening for yeah. a while. Right? For 20 years yeah. now. Yeah. So, but, so I take it, so what do people do for jobs, right? Because rich people employ people, they have factories. So do, are there a lot of, what is the employment rate in Venezuela? Is it high or low or what is it like? It's a good question because when, for instance, uh, more than 15 years ago when Chavez started the land seizures, right, of public lands, taking them back into the hands of the state so they could redistribute them to farmers. It's reported that more than four million Colombians moved into Venezuela to farm. Because wow. there's an ongoing war in Colombia. Right. And there's paramilitary terror and narco-trafficking terror. So a lot of people in the countryside of Colombia are either forced into the cities or in this case, they were allowed to come into Venezuela and start farming and making a productive economy and building new towns. So new towns have arisen all around the border areas with Colombia, you know? Wow. And some of that is planned with the government, but much of it is just Colombians who want to farm and are making a success of it and raising families are able to develop, you know, local communities. Um, so ethnically, there's not that much different. If you're Venezuelan on this side and Colombian on this, you probably have the same racial mixture in the same tribes. And that's the yeah. dream of Bolivar. That's why it's called the Bolivarian Revolution. Bolivar said, we're all the same, you know, and we're one people. We're not, we're not different. And he united five, maybe six countries, you know, from Panama to Bolivia, uh, Colombia, Venezuela, etc. He united those, and um, that was Bolivar's dream: was to have a kind of a United States of Latin America, but without wealthy landowners dictating everything. Bolivar wanted the common people to rule, and that's what the attempt is to do now: is that the working class, the peasants, the common people, they have a democratic say in what their future is. And um, your question, back to your question, it's difficult because say the GM plant that was there is now shut down and it's idle. And you can't just open up an auto plant overnight, right? It takes years of planning and you got to get the materials and put it together. But they have new industries. So like Chavez had bought out the cement industry from Carlos Slim in Mexico, the wealthiest billionaire in, in this hemisphere. He bought them out, and then they started the housing program, right? And they get help from China to have these cement firms come in that teach people how to, how to make cement quickly, efficiently, and how to build housing units quickly, efficiently, and good quality. So that's where the employment is coming in. People aren't getting paid wages like we get in the U.S. because they're gearing this economy, again, towards the productive economy, and towards serving the needs of the people. And so people's wages, if you look them up, they're very low. But you're getting food deliveries every week. You've got a new apartment that you live in, right? And so the economy has to be too. redeveloped. Yeah, and education is for everybody. It's just for the rich, you know. And, and your, your health care. Most people didn't ever have health care before, the majority. In Venezuela, you know. Yeah. They didn't have health care. Now they all have access to it. And you have to pay something, but it's very low cost. So, but, but I think that's also part of the struggle. Like Kate says, not everything's perfect. They, they have to figure out how to have. have they have to figure out themselves. We can't figure out. That's right. You know? 
It has to develop more still. So true, what, one of the things I like to tell people about Puerto Rico and Venezuela, great talk, I, great talk. I, I, thank you. I say, you know, look, Venezuela had a complete power outage. I don't, don't care what Kate said. <laughs> <laughs> the, the entire grid went down, right, in Venezuela. And it was out for three days, pitch black, except for where the rich people lived, because they had generators. Yeah. So they opened up restaurants and ate all the food they could. But, but everywhere else, three days without power. Puerto Rico still doesn't have power. Yeah, I know, I know. Three days. Oh, no, three know. days and Trump is like, they yeah, don't know how to take care of their country. Yeah. We should overthrow them. Yeah. Well, Mr. Trump, Puerto Rico, yeah. one year. Yeah. We should overthrow you. Not real Americans. <laughs> <laughs> but what will the Venezuelans do? They'll invest in a system that makes it not reliant on one large hydroelectric dam. They're going to get um, solar panels from China. Yeah, from China. China's <laughs> producing solar panels in Cuba now for less than a penny a panel. All right. Yeah. This is insane. They're going to change the whole world, and if we don't change, there will be a revolution yeah, here. These revolutionary movements have a tendency to end up with dictators and author, author, uh, say that word, authoritarian, authoritarian. authoritarian governments. It happens over and over again, and it happened in Venezuela as well. Um, yeah, the women I met, they, uh, you know, they're dictators. They're uh, the mayors and the cabinet members. I met a bunch of women who are in power. And uh, they're not going to give up power to, to rich guys. It's kind of a again. process, though, I think. Yeah. Process. It's a process. I just. I read an article. The dictator has a million people on the street. They control it. First, they got to control it. You know, they love them. I just read an article in the Progressive where where the people of Queens, uh, there's about, I don't know, 300,000 mostly Latinos or whatever, uh, they just kicked Amazon out. Mm -hmm. And it was a done deal. They were going to come in and, and they were going to build their big thing and employ 25 people or something and push all the poor people out of Queens. And, and they stopped it. They, they, and it was mostly women. And, or co uh, Cortez, President of the was a big My nephew lives in And he said and there were so many languages of people. And if they built this huge warehouse, it would disrupt everything. It would lose a community. And you'd just, yeah. yeah, it would push them right really out of the city. No jobs. No. no. Yeah. They stopped it. You're welcome. Thank you, Kim.